Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. Thank you for all that you bring forth this night to establish us in the truth. Thank you for everything you accomplish. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We started to share with you on Sunday evening on the subject of the triunity of the Godhead. We talked about Old Testament scriptures. Tonight we're going to review and go through the New Testament scriptures. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. This is Israel's great confession. They believe that he is one only, singularly, singularly Lord. Well, we've taken the time to look at the Old Testament scriptures. Important certainly to know who God is. Is he one? Is he one just singularly, or is he one with a plurality of persons? You know, the cults teach that there is only one God, and they deny the three persons of the Godhead. So do the Jews, of course, and so do even Pentecostal groups that are what are referred to as oneness that deny the person of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They claim their titles are manifestations. Well, they're in error, as you will definitely see tonight. We must realize that also the Christians are in error because Christians have called the Godhead the Trinity. Trinity means three, three gods. We don't have three gods. We have one God. It's right here, one Lord. But we have three persons in the Godhead. We must realize that. We get this term, say, Godhead, where did this come from? From the Word of God. That's where you get everything from. Acts chapter 17, verse 29. If we don't get it from the Word of God, there's a problem. Acts 17, 29. For, much then, more, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone graven by art or man's device. We see another reference to it. We looked at these before, but we'll look at them briefly again. Romans 1.20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And we see one other use of this in the New Testament, the Godhead. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So, we're talking about the Godhead. At the same time, we know the Godhead is one. So we took the time to look at Old Testament scriptures. We're just going to review the points that we saw, just briefly, but not going through all the scriptures, but just some of them. First of all, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God. When we look at the word God, it is the word Elohim, which is the plural word for God. That means God, the Godhead, is a plurality. It is used 2,346 times, translated God with a large uh, capital G. That shows that Elohim, which is the word for God, the plural form, is what is used continually throughout the Old Testament. We also mention the fact that there is a singular form of it. In fact, it even says here the plural of number 433. 433 is the word Eloah, if you notice below, and this is the singular form of God. It's only used 57 times, 52 times translated God with a capital G. Here's one case that we looked at. It's in Psalms. 18, verse 31, it speaks of both of these. For who is God, Eloah, which is the singular form of God, save the Lord? Or who is a rock, save our Elohim, God? That means God is a, referred to in a singular sense, but also referred to as a plurality as well. We also saw that Elohim was translated gods in 190 verses, and we'll just look at one verse. <coughs> Excuse me, Deuteronomy chapter 7. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, we look at verse 25, an example. The graven image of their gods 
Elohim, this is when they're used of false gods, shall you burn with fire, thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that's on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein, for it's an abomination to the Lord thy God, Elohim. So here it's translated the true God, and it's also translated for false gods. Now the other thing we pointed out is the fact that the Jews believe that God, even though it's a plural form, is only one God singular. And one of the reasons they believe that is because when you look at this where it says in the beginning God created, the word created is the word bara. This particular word is singular, meaning we have a God form followed by a singular verb. So they conclude, well, he's got to be, even though it's a plurality form, he's a singular God because it's got a singular verb after that. Well, there are plural uses of this where we see Elohim used of the true God followed by a plural verb. We'll just take one of the ones that we showed. Genesis chapter 20, verse 13, came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house. This is, as you will see, a plural form here. When we look at this. This is the word, err or to wander about. Notice, it's plural. So here's a case where God, the plurality, is followed by a plural verb. So that destroys their belief on that one. They must not have paid attention to these things. We also saw that in Genesis 35, 7, where God appeared, and it's a plural verb. In 2 Samuel 7, 23, where God went, a plural verb. And Psalms 58, 11, where God that judgeth, it plural as well. These four examples show that God, who is a plurality, Elohim, is followed by a plural God. You know, that shows the plurality of the Godhead. We also saw that there were plural pronouns referring to God that make it very clear that we're talking about a plurality of the Godhead. We saw it in Genesis 1.26. God said, let us, that's a plural pronoun, make man in our image, plural pronoun, after our likeness, another plural pronoun. As we pointed out, this couldn't be talking about God and some angels doing this because angels are not made in the image of God and they're not made after the likeness of God. This is talking about those ones who are the plurality of the Godhead. This clearly shows that there is a plurality of the Godhead and we saw other scriptures that showed that as well. We also saw that there were scriptures that showed plural descriptions of God, where plural nouns and adjectives were used. Let's just look at one of these. So we looked at all this before. We're just giving you the basic principles that we saw. Ecclesiastes 12.1, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. The word creator is plural. Young's translates it correctly, the creators. And this is what it's talking about. When we talk about creators, this is the word in the Hebrew for it, and it is plural. Nobody but Young's has translated it creators. The rest of them all translated it singular, even though it's plural. We also saw that when it talks about in Joshua 24, 19, a holy God, holy is plural. Holy gods, referring to the Godhead. And then in Isaiah 54, 5, we saw for thy maker, plural as well, by makers, it speaks of. So these are examples as well. And then we see some other scriptures we looked at. We saw examples where it speaks of besides him, which makes you think that there's only one, but it's also at the same time is speaking about the plurality of the Godhead. When it says, unto thee it is showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, he is God, Elohim, there is none else besides him, referring to the singular Godhead. Nonetheless, though, it uses the word Elohim, 
We saw scriptures about that as well. We also then took time to look at scriptures that show God is one to identify what it means to be one, and that is so important. We talked about, if we go back to Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, and this is their big statement, the Jews, their confession. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. We talk about the word one. It is a united one. It is the word echad. And we went through 10 different passages of Scripture showing echad being used as a compound unity or a united one. Let's just look at a few of these rather quickly just to show you this again. In Genesis 1, verse 5, when it speaks of the evening and the morning were the first echad day. What makes up the day? The evening and the morning together. The two come and bring a united day. There are two parts to the day. We saw in Genesis 2, verse 24, a man shall leave his father and his mother, shall cleave unto his wife. They shall be one flesh, a cod. Are they only one person? No. They're two persons that are united together as one. That shows the fact that we're, not, we're talking about not just a singular, absolute one, but instead we're talking about a united one. Here was another case that we saw, and we won't look at them all, but we'll look at a few more. Genesis 34, verse 16. We, then will we give our daughters unto you. We will take your daughters to us. That's plural, all this is talking about. We will dwell with you, and we, every one of us, all talking about a plurality for, uh, pronouns here, we will become one people, a cod. So the whole group becomes a united one. That's what the word means. Here was another one over in Numbers, chapter 13. And this is so important to understand because you've got to understand what one means. It means a united one, not an absolute one. Numbers 13, verse 23, they came to the brook of Eshcol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, an echad cluster. Well, when you have a cluster of grapes, we just don't have one grape. we got a whole lot of grapes that make up that cluster. So what is it? It's a united uh, group of grapes that form the one cluster. And we saw it in several of the places uh, where the children of Benjamin, they became one troop. We saw that the men were knit together as one man, as in Judges 20, verse 11. Uh, we saw in Ezra 2.64, the whole congregation was one group, all the people together. And in Ezra 3.1, that the children themselves were as one man to Jerusalem, all of them together, one echad, united man. And we'll look at one last one. This is in Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37, we look at verse 16. Moreover, thou son of man, take the one stick, a cod, and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel's companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel's companions. Join them one, a cod, to another into one stick. All of them join together and become one, a cod stick. So what is that? And, it said, and he goes on and says, they shall become one in thine hand. So the sticks are joined together to become one. It is a compound one. We also pointed out the fact that if it was to be a singular one, there is a Hebrew word for absolute unity, or an absolute one, which is yakid. This is used, translated only most of the time, in the Old Testament, but here's an example of it, Genesis 22, 2. He said, take thou thy son, thine only son. This is the word yakid, which is the singular one in the Hebrew. So if God was an absolute one, he would have used yakid everywhere. But hardly used this at all. Instead, 
It is to use Echad. The Echad is the one God. And we saw other scriptures that showed the Godhead comprised of, of at least two persons and even one in Isaiah 48 of three persons. And we also answered, and we'll just point this last part out, the question that many people have to try to think that Jesus is the Father, which is not true. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, unto us, a ch unto us a child is born, speaking of Jesus. Unto us a son is given, speaking of Jesus. The government shall be upon his shoulder, speaking of Jesus. His name, speaking of Jesus, shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. People have said, see, Jesus is the Father. Not so, because what this actually means, it means the Father of eternity or the Father of the future, of futurity. Many, there's one, Young's translates it correctly, the Father of eternity. Wilson's words, Old Testament word studies, declares this is the Father of eternity. The Emphasized Bible by Rotherham translates it the Father of futurity. Darby translated it the Father of eternity. Even the Douay Rheims, which is the Catholic one, translated the Father of the world to come, talking about something of the future. It is not talking about the Father himself. It is talking about why he is the Father of eternity. And why is that? Because Jesus is the one who's accomplished the redemption and made the way for everlasting life. He was the one who brought it forth. That's why he's referred to as the Father of eternity. So this again is not talking about him being the heavenly Father, the same as that, as people have tried to say. See that. So what we see from all this, we've covered all this the last time, we have the Godhead and we have them one as a united one, but we have three persons in the Godhead. And they are revealed clearly who they are in the New Testament. We talked about that there are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we pointed out that they are called God. And we'll show you this again for a moment. Galatians 1 verse 3, grace be to you and peace from God the Father. And we see the phrase God the Father many times throughout the New Testament. So we know he's, the God, he's God, but we also see in Hebrews 1 8, where the Father says unto the Son, but unto the Son he saith, the Father speaking to the Son. What does he say to the Son? Thy throne, O God, he calls the Son God is forever and ever, a scepter of righteousness, a scepter of thy kingdom. So Jesus is called God. And we also mentioned that the Holy Spirit is also God. And we saw the scripture that shows this, where in Acts 5, 3, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? He's the third person of the Godhead, to keep back part of the price of the land. While it remained, was it not thine own? After it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Well, the verse before, he said he was lying to the Holy Ghost. And now he says he's lying to God. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit is God also. So we have God the Father, we have God the Son, and we got God the Holy Spirit. And we see the three persons of the Godhead, and we took the time and went through 10 different passages of Scripture uh, the last time where we saw the Godhead being revealed. Let's just look at it, a couple of these and we'll refer to the other ones as well as we're looking at this. Matthew 3, verse 16, that is, and 17. Here's Jesus. He's here in the flesh. He's being baptized. What happens? When he's being baptized, the heavens are open. You saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Well, that's a different person, the Spirit of God coming upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven. <clears throat> well, that's not there on earth, and that's not coming down from heaven, that's up in heaven. A voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Who has a voice? A person. It's the Father in heaven who was speaking. This is my beloved Son. So here we see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not talking about titles. Titles don't have a voice. 
Titles don't have flesh and blood. Titles don't come down from heaven upon a person. No, this is all talking about the three persons of the Godhead. We also saw in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, when we're baptizing them in the name, into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Name, singularly, is modified by these three words in the genitive case, which with a, they have a definite article before each one, referring to a specific person. That's the way the Greek refers to things. So it's the name of the Father, thus and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. It wasn't, it, it definitely, whenever you see these, here's the definite article before the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, which is down here. So this is again showing, these are talking about the three persons of the Godhead. Here's another place in Luke chapter 1. It's important to see this so you understand anybody that tries to deny the three persons of the Godhead, they're not looking at the scriptures, that's for sure, clearly. Luke 1, 35, the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. That's one person of the Godhead. The power of the highest shall overshadow thee. That's the second person of the Godhead. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. We also saw another one of the ones we looked at in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We saw that the, the Godhead is involved in the manifestation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Verse 4, there's diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Differences of administration, but the same Lord, that would be Jesus. Diversities of operations, but the same God, which worketh or is energized, operative, all in all, and that is speaking of the Father. We also see these listed out. Again, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 4. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, referring to the Father, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all, the three persons of the Godhead. And we saw others as well. We'll look at a couple more. 1 John 5, verse 7. Even though there is a problem with having the original manuscripts, they were in the original Bibles, and it's been shown that this should be a part of the Word of God as some people try to reject this verse. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And we know that Jesus called the Word because John 1.14 says, The Word was made flesh and dwelled among us. These three are one. They are in unity. They're not the same. They are in unity. And we talked about how they're in each other as to relationship, with each other as to fellowship. Each one has their function in the Godhead, carrying out the things that their, their responsibilities are. So we saw this, the three persons of the Godhead. Uh, these are some of the ones we saw actually 10 different passages of Scripture. Now we're going to pick up from there and go on through several Scriptures. And this is important for you, especially for those people who are misguided, who have been believed in the oneness Pentecostal apostolic belief. And these people are misguided. In fact, they're in trouble because they do not have the Father or the Holy Spirit as a person. They believe that it is Jesus. It's all Jesus, different manifestations of Jesus. What a mistake. Let's look and show clearly there's more than one person of the Godhead in the New Testament. Matthew eleven twenty-seven. 27. All things are delivered unto me, that's a person, of my Father. That's another person. <laughs> no man knoweth the Son, but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. Clearly, we see two people here. Matthew 16, verse 17. Jesus answered and said unto him, speaking to Peter here, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, another name for him, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So Jesus is speaking, and he's saying, the Father revealed it to you. So again, that is two persons. Here's when we see in Matthew 17, 
when there was a transfiguration. And in verse 5, here we see, While yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. This is when Jesus was transfigured, as it speaks of in verse 2. So here we see Jesus was there, and yet at the same time, we hear this voice again coming out of the cloud, speaking this to different people. My beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Again, that's referring to two separate people. We see a scripture in Matthew chapter 20, in verse 23. He said, you shall drink indeed of my cup, be baptized with a baptism that I'm baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left, it's not mine to give. Well, if that means Jesus is not involved in it, well, who's gonna do it? It shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. That means Jesus is not involved in where people are gonna sit. It's the Father who does that. So clearly we see two persons of the Godhead. We see another one here in Matthew 26, verse 39. He went a little further and fell on his face. This is when he's ready to go to the cross. He's in Gethsemane. Prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. Well, this is talking about the Father and talking about me, which is Jesus. He has a will and he acknowledges the Father, whatever the Father's will is, he wants to follow that. Two persons. Verse 42, very similar. He went away again the second time, prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Now, people have wills. We have the will of the Father and we have the will of Jesus. So Jesus is submitting to the will of the Father and not his own, as he speaks of two wills of two different persons of the Godhead. We also see in Matthew 26, verse 53, a statement Jesus makes. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. Here we see the Father, who would be giving the, from heaven, would be sending these angels, and this is Jesus praying, or speaking here, again, two persons of the Godhead. And the scripture that we didn't have before us the other day, talking about the fact that Jesus doesn't know the exact time when he's coming back. It's Mark chapter 13 in verse 32. This speaks of when he's coming back. We don't know the day or the hour, which is referring to the Feast of Trumpets time. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Well, if the Son doesn't know it, but only the Father knows it, they have to be two different people. <laughs> it's a no-brainer, isn't it? It's astounding that people will think that there is not one, that they think that there's just one, when it's clear here there's two. We also see another place over in Luke, chapter 23. This is when Jesus is being taken to the cross. And we see in Luke 23, verse 34, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus is there speaking to the Father to forgive them. Two persons of the Godhead. <clears throat> We're taking the time to go through this because when you see all these scriptures, how could anybody think that there's only one? But it's astounding the people that have thought and even today still believe that there's only one person of the God, of God, that's God. John 5, 17, Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Well, that's two different persons doing work. Verse 22, For the Father judgeth no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son. Here's another case where we see the Father's not doing the judging. Well, who's doing the judging? The Son is. Two persons referred to here. We see in verse 43. I am come in my Father's name. You receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him will you receive. I'm come in my Father's name. That's two persons there. And when Jesus did all the works, did he do the works in his name? No, he didn't do anything in his name. 
John 10, 25, that Jesus answered them, I told you, you believe not the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Two persons spoke of. In John chapter 8, verse 16, Yet if I judge my judgments true, for I am not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. Here again, referring to the I and the Father. And also, these people try to deny that Jesus came from heaven, that he was just the result of a physical birth on the earth, and that God came into him after he was born, which is a lie. Well, the Father sent him. He goes on and says in verse 17, it's also written in your law, the testimony of two men is true. Well, that's two different people. I am one that bear witness of myself, one person, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. That is two different people. Verse 28, then said Jesus unto them, when you've lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself. Well, Jesus, he didn't do anything himself. That's a person. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. He only did what the Father wanted him to do. In fact, we even see here, he says, He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. He didn't do what he wanted to do. He did what the Father did. Clearly, two separate persons. Verse 49. Here's where Jesus answered, I am not a devil, but I honor my Father, and you do dishonor me. Two different people again referred to. Verse 54, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It's my Father that honoreth me, of whom you say that he is your God. He wouldn't honor himself. The Father honored him. Two separate people. Now in John chapter 10, this is a favorite verse of people that try to say that God is only one. John 10, verse 30. They say, I and my Father are one. Or, not, my is not in there, but I and the Father are one. So that's the scripture they'll bring to you right off the bat. They'll throw that out at you. Well, that's true. People get shaken over that because they think that, whoa, then that means he's only one. Yeah, it doesn't mean he's the same. That means they're one. They are one in unity. They are one in the Godhead, but they have different functioning. We go back for a moment, and you'll see this. My Father, which gave, which gave them me, is greater than all. Well, if he's greater, we're talking about two different people. No man's able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Now they say, well, see, that still says they're one. Well, Let's look at another place where it talks about I and the Father are one and see what it says. John 17, verse 21. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they may also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Well, this is saying that Jesus and the Father are one. And notice, when he refers to it as one, he says the one in us, a plurality. So they are a plurality in, that are in one. And he's even talking about us being one. Why? Because we're all in unity according to the ways of the Word of God, in fellowship with Him, and one, one walking in line with the Word of God. We come in unity together. We also see a scripture over in uh, John chapter 14, verse 6, says this, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Two different people. You can't get to the Father unless you come through Jesus. Very clear. Verse 16, I, the person of Jesus, will pray the Father, another person, he shall give you another comforter, that's the Holy Spirit, that he may abide with you forever, the three persons of the Godhead. Verse 21, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me, Jesus, one person, shall be loved of my Father, a second person. I will love him and will manifest myself to him. 
Then we come to verse 23. Jesus answered and said, If a man love me, one person, Jesus, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, a second person. And we see it's clearly talking about two persons because now we have a plural pronoun here as well. And we will come unto him. Well, that's two persons, that is in one, and make our two persons abode with him. Very clear. Verse 14, He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. He was sent by the Father. And he's not speaking his word, he's speaking the Father's word. Two different persons. Verse 28, You've heard how I said unto you, Go, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you would rejoice, because I said, I go unto my Father, for my Father is greater than I. I, Jesus, Father, second person. And then it even says the Father is greater than I. He is in the chain of command. The Father has the preeminence in the chain of command. He's the cause referred to as one who's greater. We see in John chapter 15, verse 1, I'm the true vine, Jesus, my Father's the husband. That's the second person. Verse 8, Here it is my Father glorified, one person, you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples, a second person. As the Father hath loved me, the two persons, so have I loved you. In verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, one person, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, a second person. These are all so clear. Verse 23, he that hateth me hates my father also, two persons. And then the next verse really makes it clear. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. What does both mean? It means two, doesn't it? Me and my father, two people. Very clear. Verse 26, when the comforters come, one person the Godhead, whom I will send, Jesus, the second person the Godhead, will send unto you from the Father, that's, there's the third person listed, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. Then we see in John 16, you know these people, the oneness ones that are just so deceived, they pray to Jesus. <laughs> John 16, 23 says, and this is Jesus speaking, in that day you shall ask me nothing. They're praying to Jesus, and he said out of his own mouth, you aren't going to ask me anything. They are misguided big time. Verily, verily, I say, Jesus, unto you, whatsoever you ask the Father, who do we pray to? The Father, in my name, he will give it to you. It's the Father who gives it to us. Verse 26, at that day, talking about the day of the New Testament, you shall ask in my name, I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. I'm not going to pray the Father for you. You've got to pray the Father for yourself. Two persons, Jesus and the Father being referred to. Verse 28, I came forth from the Father. You see, the oneness people deny that he came forth from the Father. They think, again, it was a physical birth, and then Jesus came into him after he was born from a physical birth. <laughs> what a lie. I came forth from the Father, and I am coming to the world. And again, I leave the world and go to the Father. <laughs> Two persons came from the Father, and now he's going back to the Father. We see over in verse 32. Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that you shall be scattered every man to his own, you shall leave me, and shall leave me alone. Yet I'm not alone, because the Father is with me. Two persons. Now, this is interesting in John 17. This is his high priestly prayer. It says, These words spake Jesus, lifted up his eyes to heaven. This is when he's on earth. And said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. Now, Again, remember they say, he didn't come from heaven, from the Father. 
Listen to this one, verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. He was with the, world, he was with the Father before the world was. And this is talking about Jesus. Well, how could that be if he wasn't with him and he didn't come from the Father? He was with the Father. These people are totally deceived. Then we see in verse 8. I've given unto them the words that thou gavest me, and they have received them, have known surely that I came out from thee. That's right. And they have believed as thou did send me. Two different persons. In verse 11, now this switches to Jesus is in heaven, the words that are being recorded. Because look what he says. Now I'm no more in the world. I'm not here now. This is him speaking as what Jesus would say from heaven. But these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep thou through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, and they may be one as we are. Plural pronoun again. We got two persons again. Verse 21. That they all, we saw this before, may be one. We're all to be one in unity. As though thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us the plural, as we saw. Verse 22, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. So the thing that says the Father and I, I and the Father are one, yeah, we're all in unity together. We are one. That doesn't mean you're the same, which is what they try to say, which is ridiculous. We also see in John chapter 20, Verse 17, we're going through many scriptures. So you have, a, a, without a shadow of a doubt, know that there's three persons of the Godhead. John 20, verse 17, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I'm not yet ascended to my Father. Jesus is here on earth, the Father's up in heaven. Go to my brother and say unto them, I send unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Again, we see this. Verse 21, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. He brings this out about him being sent time and time again. How could people think that Jesus didn't come from the Father in heaven? See, they have to say that, but it's the only way they can get away with deny, say he's only one God. They, they can't say that he came from heaven and from the Father. That means two persons. They got to say he was just born physically, and then the one who's up in heaven came into him. Just a different manifestation. <laughs> so deceptive, so deceived. It's astounding. Acts 1, verse 7. He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. This means authority. <clears throat> oh, Jesus doesn't, have the, doesn't know about this, but the Father does. We also see in Acts chapter 2, did Jesus have the Holy Spirit to send into the earth? No, because the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Acts 2.33, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. Notice, Jesus exalted at the right hand. Well, if he's at the right hand, somebody is next to him. That's another person. That's the Father. And what did he do? He got from the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost. So we see the three persons of the Godhead here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us something. Verse 24. Jesus will be ruling in a thousand-year millennial reign. Then cometh the end when he shall deliver up, all, deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall put down all rule and all authority and power. Jesus is going to give the kingdom back to the Father. Two persons spoken of here. In verse 28, When all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. He's going to then be submitted back unto the Father himself. Two persons of the Godhead. We saw this before, but we'll drive it home to you again. The Father is speaking here. Hebrews 1.8, unto the Son, 
He saith, Thy throne, O God. Well, that tells you something. They think he just became the son when he was, after he was born physically, and then he just became the son on earth. Well, this is when he's in heaven. <laughs> he's called the son. He's still the son. Total deception, they believe. Unto the son, thy throne, O God. He calls him God. He's it there. He's enthroned up there as forever and ever, a scepter of righteousness, a scepter of thy kingdom. We also see this testimony that's given, 1 John chapter 1, verse 3. That which we've seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is who? With the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We have fellowship with both, two persons. Chapter 2, verse 22. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. That's two different persons. persons. That means someone who denies the two, two persons here that speaking of, they're Antichrist. These guys are in trouble. Very serious trouble. Look at verse 24. He Let that therefore abide in you which you've heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Well, these people don't even think that there is a Father. They think he's just a title. Lies. Total deception. They're in trouble. That's for sure. And this really shows you that are these guys even going to be saved? Pretty questionable. 2 John 1, 9. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not, is not having God, literally. He that abides in the doctrine of Christ, he's having both. Ah, that means two persons, doesn't it? The Father and the Son. That means if you're abiding in the doctrine of Christ, you've got both the Father and the Son. But if you're not abiding in the doctrine of Christ, which means you're obviously not believing in the Father and the Son, you're not having God. Are you even saved? Doesn't sound like it. If you're not having God, I wouldn't think that you're saved whatsoever. Here's another real clear scripture. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. To him that overcometh, conquers, and carries off the victory, will I grant to sit with me in my throne. That's one throne, the throne of Jesus. Even as I also overcame and have sat down with my Father in his throne. That's two different thrones and two different people. Well, can't be one. They can't be titles. They're persons. Revelation chapter 5, speaking of Jesus in verse 1, I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne, that's the Father, a book written within and on the backside sealed with the seven seals. This is the title deed to the earth. The Father's holding this. In verse 6, and behold, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. Well, who's the lamb? Jesus. Well, this is a different person. As it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which is seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And I became and took, and he came, this is the lamb, Jesus, came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Well, who's that? The Father. We've got two persons here as well. Two persons. And we even see, when we do come to <clears throat> the new heavens and the new earth, Revelation 22, verse 1, He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and the Lamb. We got the God, that's the Father and the Lamb. That's Jesus. There are three persons in the Godhead. Now, as we pointed out, is this the Trinity? No. They're all one, remember. It's the triunity of the Godhead. Now, how can we understand this? Well, we need to understand some things. And we've, we, of course, we've seen the fact that there's, there's three aspects of, you know, time and time again, such as when we see, just come over here again, just to bring this up. We see we have the Father, we have the Son, and we have the Holy Spirit, the three 
persons of the Godhead. How does this operate? They are one. There is only one Godhead. They relate to each other. The three persons are in, in unity. They are in each other in unity and in each other as to relationship. There are scriptures that say the Father's in the Son, the Son's in the Father in relationship. They also are with each other as to fellowship. Remember it talked about how our fellowship is with the Father and with Jesus Christ. There's also a chain of command in the scripture from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit. The Son is from the Father as to authority because the Father's the one who sent him. Time and time it says how he sent him. We see that over and over and over. John chapter 3. See, they deny this. This is the thing you have to understand about these people that are so deceived. They say, again, he was born after the flesh, not from eternity. He didn't come from eternity. He just came from, he was born after the flesh and then he came into him. <laughs> crazy. Absolutely crazy. John chapter 3, verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God sent the Son. Well, that meant he came from somewhere. Where did he come from? He came from heaven, remember? And who was he? He's the Word. Look what happened. The Word became Ginnemai flesh. That's the Word that was from heaven and came and he, we beheld his glory. The glory is the only born begotten of the Father. He's born of the Father. So the chain of command goes from the Father, God the Father, to God the Son, to God the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, as we've seen in John 15, 26. He proceedeth from the Father. And remember, Jesus did not have the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost to send into the earth. He had to get it in order to be able to send it in. The chain of command comes from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit. Being by the right hand of God exalted, having received of the Father, or from, this is the word para, from the Father. They didn't translate it well here. It should be from, para, the Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost. He got it from him. He has shed forth this which you now see and hear. We also know, when we've talked about how the Holy Spirit doesn't originate things, what does he do? Remember what it speaks of? How in John 16, 13, he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. The Holy Spirit hears from above, from Jesus, and then brings that forth. Otherwise, he's not originating things. He's just relaying things. The chain of command goes from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit. And we also know Jesus was operating, doing exactly what the Father wanted him to do. He's not the one who was calling everything, speaking in whatever he wanted. Remember, he said, the Father is greater than I, which was in the chain of command. And what, where, where did Jesus get his words from? <laughs> he got them from the Father. He says, Believe thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father which dwelleth in me. There's still God, but he's not speaking. It's coming from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit. That's the way he does it, and that's also how the works are done as well. We even see the testimony in John uh, 5, 19, where he said that Jesus uh, said, answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do, what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Look, everything's coming from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit. And we saw that with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we get born again, another thing, they, people, these oneness people, say that there's only one God, and they say that if you receive Christ or you receive the Holy Spirit, it's the same one. Doesn't matter, whichever you want to receive. <laughs> or you receive Jesus, you got the same thing. That's ridiculous. Not so. 
What do we see even prophesied in the Old Testament? Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. This is the prophecy of what happens when you get born again. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. What's that? The Spirit of Christ, which we get when we receive Jesus and be born again. Then the next verse says, and I will put my spirit within you. What spirit is that? That's the Holy Spirit who is put within us. We see the two different spirits clearly shown. We also see that we, when we get the spirit of Jesus Christ, when we receive Jesus, what, 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 what is that? Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. Because your sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That's how you have relationship with the Father, because you have the spirit of Jesus Christ that comes into you. That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is received afterwards. Now, we know that from many scriptures. We see in Acts chapter 8, verse 14, when the apostles of Jerusalem heard Samaria had received the word of God and they got born again, then they came down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them. They weren't. They didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. Only they were, have been baptized. Remember, this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit into the name of the Lord Jesus. And then they laid their hands on and they received the Holy Ghost. This is received afterwards. We know another good scripture that shows this, of course, is Luke eleven thirteen. 13. Notice what it says. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Well, if there is, this talks about the Father and this talks about the Holy Spirit. That's two different persons right there. And furthermore, who are you praying to? The heavenly Father. Well, that means you must have a relationship already to God as heavenly Father. That denotes relationship. And it says you're going to ask Him, I tell you, make a demand what's due you, to give you the Holy Spirit. Why would you be asking your Heavenly Father to give you the Holy Spirit? Because you don't have Him yet. Well, that shows we don't get the Holy Spirit yet. You see, the oneness line teaching says that when you receive Christ or it's the Holy Spirit, you got it all in one shot. And they also say, in order to be saved, you have to speak in tongues. They say that if you do not receive, you have the Holy Spirit, which they think also was Jesus, different, different manifestation, and speak in tongues. And they also say you've got to be baptized in water to be saved. Otherwise, you're not saved. Total lie. We already saw that from Acts chapter 10, where they were born again, had the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues, and they weren't water baptized at all. Water baptism does nothing to produce a new birth on the inside of you. And furthermore, you can get the Holy, you have the Holy Spirit received after you're born again. And furthermore, if you don't speak in tongues, that doesn't mean you could be born again and have the Holy Spirit and not speak in tongues yet. But this is what these people teach. Again, this is an abomination. These people are a cult. I had a guy come one time, I'll never forget, in Ohio. He came in and he said, I mean, he was almost in tears. He was so upset. Because he said, they told me that I'm not saved. I said, why? Have you received G Jesus? He says, they told me I'm not saved because I don't speak in tongues. They told me I, well, I, I had to receive. and I got, They said, I already got the Father and the Holy Spirit because I supposedly received him, but I don't speak in tongues. So that means I must not have him because they think it's with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Well, I said I'd received it. Received him. <laughs> it's all a lie, that what they teach. Because they think that if you receive one, you got the whole package, and you have to speak in tongues and be baptized in water, otherwise you're not saved. What a lie. Of course, I told them, I said, that's all a lie. Did you receive Jesus? You got born again. I showed them you got the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Have you prayed to receive the Holy Spirit since, though? He didn't even know anything about that. We prayed to have him receive the Holy Spirit after that. And then helped him to get his prayer language, showed him he had his prayer language and helped him to get his prayer language. So he saw that the whole thing was a lie, what they told him. Even this guy was, he was in torment. 
He thought he was, you know, on his way to hell because he didn't speak in tongues, as they told him. What a lie. So, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three separate persons. They are never identical as the person. They're in unity as one in the Godhead. They're in each other as to relationship. They're with each other as to fellowship. Each carries out his own, their specific function in the Godhead. And the chain of command is from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit. Now let's cover just for a few more minutes before we stop for this evening, just the false teachings that they say. Again, they say that, that John 10, this is just to help, help you for when they tell you this, or if you come across people that have been told this, this will help them. They say, John 10, 30, I and my Father are one, so they say they're the same person. False. We already saw it, scripture after scripture after scripture. But let's just give a couple that really drive home the fact that they're not the same. John 15, 24. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other men did, they had not had sin. But now they have both seen and hated both me and my father. That's two, piece of, two people. What a lie. And then the Acts, where it says in chapter 1, verse 7, not for you to know the times of seasons which the Father has put in His own authority. The Father knows it, but nobody else. And then we see in Mark chapter 13, what we saw there in verse 32, the day and the hour knows no man, not the angels are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Again, we see the Father is different from the Son, the two persons. So it's a lie what they say. Anybody tells you that, you say they're not the same person, that they are separate, they're in unity in one in the Godhead, but they're separate piece, people. They also say that Jesus is the revealed name of God in the New Testament. That's what they say it is. <laughs> That's crazy. That is absolutely false. First of all, because they think he was Jesus in heaven. Look what it says in Matthew 1, 21. She shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He wasn't called Jesus until after he was born. Why? Because of what his ministry was. For he shall save his people from their sins. What's it mean? Salvation. When it speaks of Jesus who came from heaven, what is he called? when he came into a physical body. He's the Word that was made flesh. In other words, he wasn't Jesus, the revealed name of the Godhead. He's called Jesus because that's his function. What was his function? To bring salvation. To go to the, accomplish the work, go to the cross, accomplish the redemption, and bring forth the salvation of mankind. He's called the Word. And remember what we saw in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, the three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. He wasn't called Jesus in heaven. He was called Jesus in the earth. Why? Because that was his ministry to bring salvation unto mankind. He was the Son who came from heaven, and he's still the Son now. <laughs> Remember, he became born from above, and then he, he got born again after he was in hell, and he's now, again, you'll be to me, I'll be to a father, and you'll be to me a son. He's the son, he still is that son. We're talking about in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, if you remember that. Again, when he brings in the first begotten, firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. And the verse before says, which of the angels said at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I'll be to him a father, and he'll be to me a son. Ah, he's a father and he's a son. Of course, this shows the two persons of the Godhead. They also say, again, that you, when you receive Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter, whatever you want to call him, he's the same person. It is a lie, and we pointed this out. The new spirit 
is the Spirit of Christ we get when we're born again. The my spirit of Ezekiel 36 is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is, he's called the Spirit of the Father. It proceeds from him. We didn't show you this scripture, but in Matthew chapter 10, verse 20, it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. That is the Holy Spirit. They also say there's only one God in heaven. <laughs> these are the astounding lies that these people bring forth. Look what it says in Colossians 3.1. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things that are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. That can't be the same person if he's sitting on his right hand. We got two different people. And that's in heaven. That's the picture. Hebrews 8, 1, Now the things we spoke, and this is the sum, we have such a high priest, Jesus, who sat on the right hand of the throne of the majesty, that's the Father, in the heavens. That's in heaven. See, they try to deny all that, that there's, there's only one God in heaven. <laughs> Here it says in Hebrews 12, 2, Looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised and set shame, is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Time after time we see that. And remember the one we looked at showing both of their thrones in Revelation 3.21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. And of course, the word Elohim that we saw is the word, a plural form of the word God. All of these things are lies. They don't think that Jesus was the Son of the, uh, from the Most High. They think he was called this after he came. No, that's all a lie. Luke chapter 1. Verse 32 says, He shall be great, he shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give him the throne of his Father. He's the Son of the Highest. He was the Son of the Father who was sent into the earth. Verse 35, Angel answered and said, The Holy Ghost shall come upon him, the power of the Highest. Uh, that's the Father this, bringing the Son into him. Shall overshadow thee, and the holy things shall be born, and they shall be called the Son of God. And then after that, his name was called Jesus because that was his function in the earth, which was to bring salvation to mankind. You know, even the demons knew it. <laughs> the demons knew who he was. Mark chapter 5, verse 7, look what they say. He cried a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? They knew who he was. He is the Son of of the Most High God, not something that was born physically and then declared to be Jesus or the Son at that point in time, which is a lie. These people don't believe that he, that he, sent him, that he was sent. Of course, they're all lies. There's so many scriptures on it, but we'll just look at a couple. 1 John chapter 4, verse 14. We've seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son. And what was he to do? To be the savior of the world. That was his function, what he carried out. And again, it calls him the son of the father in 2 John, verse 3, when he says, 2 John, sorry, that is, verse 3, Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, who is he? the Son of the Father. He is the Son of the Father. So they try to deny that. They have to deny it, otherwise you got more than one person. <laughs> and he came from the Father. No, nope. all lies. We have one God, the triunity of the Godhead, with three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And again, let's just Sum this up, reviewing again the, the, the fact that they are, not, they are never identical as the person. They're in unity as one in the Godhead. They're in each other as the relationship. They're with each other as the fellowship. They each has their own specific function in the Godhead. 
And again, the chain of command is from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit. The Father has the preeminence as far as it being greater. He's the one that knows when Jesus is coming back. He's the one who is the top one in the chain of command of the Godhead. That's the way they set it up. So what is it? It's a unity. It's a united one, as we saw. Why the Jews miss this is beyond me. If they just study out the word akkad and notice that it, yeah, it's not your kid, it's yakad, a compound uni, a united one. They should have never missed it. But the devil has really worked to deceive the multitudes from the truth. So we've looked at the triunity of the Godhead in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. This should firmly convince you of that reality and also help you to understand how the Godhead is one in the unity, united one, and they're functioning in the Godhead and how they operate in different, in that chain of command. Say this to me, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God that brings revelation of the truth regarding God. It's the Godhead. And there's one God, which is the Godhead, which has three persons who are one and united one in the Godhead. I thank you. I understand the chain of command from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit. And I also understand they're in each other as to relationship. They're with each other as to fellowship. And they each have their specific function in the Godhead to carry out the work of God. I thank you for this revelation. I understand it's not a trinity. I will never call it a trinity. It is a triunity of the Godhead who is one, a united one, but three persons in the Godhead. Thank you for the truth and establishing me in this. And thank you for helping everyone who has been deceived by the lying teaching of oneness Pentecostals, that they will come to repentance and turn away from the deception because they must have the Father and the Son or they're not having God according to the Word of God. Thank you, Father, for bringing the body of Christ in line with the truth understanding the triunity of the Godhead. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Father, thank you for bringing the Christian world to repentance on all these areas. All these ones that have believed it's a trinity, it's a lie. It's a triunity. All these ones who have believed that it's just one person is a lie. It's one united Godhead of three persons in the Godhead. Thank you for bringing this revelation to the entire body of Christ worldwide so they're established in the truth. And thank you for bringing these ones, the cults, that have, the word has not been taught clearly to them so they, have not, they, they, they keep thinking what they think. Thank you for bringing them to repentance and thank you for opening the eyes of the Jews to the fact that a cod is a united compound unity one and that it's speaking of the plurality of the Godhead clearly when it let us make man in our image after our likeness. Thank you, Father, for bringing this truth to the world, the fact that it is the triunity of the Godhead. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.